So today we're going to go ahead and talk about the undifferentiated hypotensive patient. There's nothing more terrifying than when your nurse tells you that your patient is suddenly hypotensive and has a blood pressure maybe in the 60s. When you get that call, every second matters, and it's important for you to have a good algorithmic approach so that you know exactly what you're going to do next for this patient. Before we go any further, we want to give a shout out to Dr. Ravi Morchi, who is our attending at Harbor UCLA and essentially drilled this algorithm into our practice. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing you need to do is to fight your instinct to spend 30 minutes and chart review. Don't do that. It's not necessary at this time and it's only going to delay you getting to the patient's bedside. And that's really what you want to do. Get to the bedside as fast as possible. Also, on your way, don't forget to bring your ultrasound. It'll be really important in this algorithm. So you've made it to the bedside, and the most important thing is to not spend a lot of time asking your patient questions. You'll see a lot of people when they first start off asking patients crazy questions when they're peri arrest. At this point, asking if the patient has chest pain or abdominal pain is not important because you're going to be assessing for all life-threatening causes for their low blood pressure. After you're done going through this algorithm, you can then ask your patient some more questions and get a little bit more history, as well as go to the computer or the chart and do a little bit of chart biopsy. But at least you know that you've gone ahead and assessed the patient for specific life-threatening causes that could be immediately reversed via interventions. So now that you're at the bedside and you've resisted the urge to ask your patient a thousand questions, let's go over step one. In this step, you want to take a moment and look at the monitor. The question that you want to ask is, is the heart rate too fast or is it too slow? So what's too fast? Is it 100, 110, 130? Usually I think of the heart rate being too fast once it succeeds a heart rate of 150. Usually by that point, you have the pads on the patient and you're getting ready to cardiovert them. And that's the main thing that you're trying to assess for when you try to see whether or not the heart rate is too fast. The bottom line is, do I need to cardiovert this patient? So what's too slow? Is it 60, a heart rate of 50? Usually I think of a slow heart rate of being less than 40 or 30. Again, this is the time when you're going to want to make sure you have the pads on and get ready to go down your pathway for bradycardia. The ultimate question being, do I need to transcutaneously pace this patient? Now that you're done with step one, we'll move to step two. For step two, you want to go ahead and grab your ultrasound and look at the patient's heart. The main things that you're looking for is if there's a pericardial effusion, if the EF is okay, or if it's crap, and finally, if there's any right heart strain. If your patient has a massive pericardial effusion, you'll want to go ahead and get ready to perform a pericardial centesis, especially if there is evidence of tamponade on your ultrasound. If the patient has an OK EF, you may want to consider whether or not you can give more fluids given that there is a preserved ejection fraction. If the EF is crappy, you'll want to think about it a little bit more and begin to consider whether or not your patient is actually in cardiogenic shock. If that's the case, then giving IV fluids would be detrimental to the patient. So you're going to be using your EF information when you look at the IVC to figure out whether or not you should actually be giving your patient any volume or whether you should actually be diuresing them. The last thing you want to look for is right heart strain. 
because if there's right heart strain, potentially your patient has a massive PE and you'll need to consider giving the patient TPA. Now that you're done assessing the heart, we'll go ahead and begin with step three. In step three, we'll actually go down and ultrasound the IVC. Now before we continue, we want to point out that the IVC has been shown to not be the best and most reliable marker for volume status. There are a lot of false positives and negatives that occur when looking at the IVC. But with that said, when your back is against the wall, it's a decent starting place until better things come along. When you look at the IVC, you want to see whether or not it's collapsible. or if it's plump and non-moving. After ultrasounding the IVC, you now want to take a second and put together all that information you have in step two and step three and develop a preliminary plan for the patient's volume status. We do this by looking at the patient's EF and their IVC and then determining what intervention we need to perform, whether or not we need to give them fluids or actually give them a diuretic because potentially they are in cardiogenic shock. If the EF is okay and the IVC is collapsible, then we should consider giving your patient IV fluids. You would want to consider giving your patient two liters of normal saline wide open. If the EF is bad and the IVC is plump, then you may actually need to give your patient a diuretic. Again, you would be doing this because you think your patient is in cardiogenic shock, and as a result, the diuresis will bring them back onto the right part of Starling's curve and improve their contractility. So let's recap. At this point, you've stopped and looked at the monitor and figured out whether or not you need to cardiovert your patient or whether or not you need to pace them. You've also taken a second to look at the patient's heart to see whether or not there's a pericardial effusion that would require pericardiocentesis, or if the EF is good or bad, and you've also figured out whether or not there was any evidence of right heart strain that could warrant the consideration of a PE and potentially TPA administration. You've also looked at the patient's IVC and figured out whether or not you need to give the patient IV fluids or whether or not they're potentially in cardiogenic shock and need to be diuresed. So in these short three steps, you've done quite a lot to go ahead and begin your initial resuscitative measures for this patient. While your nurses are hanging IV fluids or are beginning giving your patient diuretics, you'll now want to begin step four, which is to perform an EFAST or extended fast exam. If there's any free fluid that's found on this exam, it should be tapped if possible. Maybe your patient is a cirrhotic and now has spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and this overwhelming infection is what's causing your patient to be hypotensive. Or maybe your patient is anticoagulated and develop spontaneous intraperitoneal bleeding and they're hemorrhaging, and that's what's leading to their hypotension. So we're going to look at the peritoneum to see if there's any free fluid. We'll also take a look at the lungs to see whether or not there's any evidence of a pneumothorax. Maybe the patient has a tension pneumothorax, and that's what's leading them to be hypotensive. And all you need to do is stick a needle in the second intercostal space in order to decompress their chest and restore their blood pressure. Finally, in step five, we'll take a look at the patient's aorta and see whether or not there's evidence of a AAA or dissection. And that's it. Looking at these five steps, if you can use them when you are faced with an undifferentiated hypotensive patient, 
you'll at least have an algorithm and an approach that you can use to at least get life-saving interventions started. Maybe you had to stick a needle in the patient's heart or push TPA. Maybe you gave the patient fluids or actually diurese them. Maybe you had to activate a massive transfusion protocol because you found that the patient had a AAA and has free fluid on your FAST exam. Being confident with this approach will give you the confidence to face these patients when you're all alone in the middle of the night during cross cover. This algorithm can even be used in the patient who presented with transient hypotension. You can check out our lecture on that topic as well. The best part of this algorithm is once you get good at it, you can hopefully complete it in five minutes. So it's quick and it's easy. We hope that this has been helpful. Thanks for watching.